my great pleasure to introduce Margaret Prescott, coordinator of Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike in the US and host of Sojourner Truth, a radio show on KPFK Pacifica Radio. She coordinates the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders, which demands justice for the murders of over 100 black women in South Central Los Angeles. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, thank you. Really good to be here. Sorry, we had a little water spill here. I want to start um, and just to explain things. I think I have three additional minutes. Is that right? I That's better right. check because we're living by the tyranny of the clock here. <laughs> I want to start by calling some names. Valerie McCovey, Princess Bartholomew, Mary Lowe, Lucretia Jefferson, Janisha Peters, Henrietta Wright, Deborah Jackson, Bernita Sparks, Barbara Ware, Alicia Alexander. They are only 10 of over 200 black women who are missing, most likely killed in South Los Angeles, the victim of serial murders. And most people in Southern California much less the United States, much less North America have ever heard of it. I want to start there because the lives of these women, the devaluation of the lives of these women bring together sexism, racism, what people call classism or poverty. These were poor black women and also illegality because a number of them were sex workers working on the street who were homeless and they were considered expendable. Their lives didn't work worth a damn. And there was police complicity, law enforcement, criminal complicity in these murders. If they haven't participated, they certainly turned a blind eye to who was doing it because they had a relationship, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, they're part of 64,000 black women that are missing across the United States. Now, I got to tell you something. When we founded the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders back in 1985, the civil rights leaders, the black civil rights leaders, they didn't want to know. The black clergy didn't want to know. The feminists didn't want to know. All righty, because I had a black preacher tell me, Margaret, it's a moral issue. The moral issue was that these women were sex workers. Never mind, a lot of them were clients. All right, that's what I'm saying. The sexism of it, because I can assure you, we all know and we have heard about the fantastic work of a Black Lives Matter movement, their Black Lives Matter movement's organizations, and there's a Black Lives Matter movement that is global, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But I can assure you the fact that these were women and there were black women had a lot to do with their invisibility up until today. Now, it took a British filmmaker from the UK, not black Hollywood, by the way, to come to the United States and make a film called Tales of the Grim Sleeper. It was on Sky TV here, it was on HBO, uh, where a lot more people are now finding out about it. But, you know, I won't be a spoiler of that film for you, but I can tell you, the women in that film, a lot of them homeless, a lot of them sex workers, a lot of them survivors who said, I was out there, but that doesn't mean I'm trash. That doesn't mean I deserve to be killed by anybody. You know, we got a lot of trouble today. We got a lot of trouble today. A number of us have gone through the militant black movement. We were around during COINTELPRO. We watched our brothers and sisters being shot down. Teresa Schultz spoke earlier about her dad that has spent 30 years in solitary confinement. Recently, I was in Cleveland, Ohio at the Movement for Black Lives Matter conference convention. Let me tell you, the energy and the inspiration there, Chandra was there with me, Asantua was there with me. There were over 1,500 black people, mainly young, who were there. 
and I went to the workshop of the Black Panther Party, and I heard the OGs talk about how inspired they were because people were fighting it out. Not everybody agreed over there, let me tell you that. People were fighting it out, and the trans people made it clear that every black life is going to matter, and there's not going to tolerate from the black church or anybody else any discrimination against people who are LGBTQ. <laughs> but let me tell you what some of the Panthers, some of whom had spent several decades in jail, some of whom went through COINTELPRO, who went through secret court where they tried to get them to talk about this or that, and they kept their mouth shut. They talked about the importance of autonomy, which as women of color in the global women's strike, we are definitely down with. And they also talked about the importance of building what back in the day they called a united front. Now let me just say something about that. I'm from a little village in a little island that was ruled by England for 300 years straight, okay? 97% people of African descent left in our, um, in our island of this Barbados, in our island of Barbados. I want to mention that because I want to make the connection with what those Panthers said at the Black Lives Matter conference, the experience in my village in Barbados, and I'm a villager and I'm proud of it, and the people of Haiti, the black people of Haiti, the first black republic, who are the epicenter of struggle right now in the Western world for black people. I really want to emphasize that because there's a war going on in Haiti and the black lives of people in Haiti matter. But you know what? Part of what a lot of us are worried about, and I was glad to see the delegation that went to Palestine of some of the folks from Ferguson and Patrice and some of the others from Black Lives Matter. Because there was a time that we focused as a diaspora. We looked upon ourselves as black people internationally and then we became American. <laughs> okay, we became American. They started calling us Afro-Americans, uh, you know, african American, whatever the American, I don't want none of that American stuff, okay? because it separates us from our sisters and brothers in the diaspora, including on Haiti. Enough of that. All righty? So what we, were wor what we are worried about right now is that the focus of Black Lives Matter has to be on the street because the sister here is absolutely right. There, there are also more black men in prison today than in 1850, that were enslaved in 1850. This we learned from Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow, so we know about those figures, okay? But we also know the struggle that, that if we are not, if we are only focused on what is in front of our face, and it broke my heart to hear about your family member and all the folks happening in Scotland here in, in the UK, all righty? that if we are not looking at what is happening to the people in Haiti, what is happening to our sisters and brothers behind bars, because I'll I wanted to mention Haiti, and I also wanted to mention the prisoners, because a lot of those Panthers you refer to, a lot of them spent time also on the inside. But Haiti, Black Lives Matter, on the streets of the UK, of Scotland, of Canada, and the United States. They also matter in Haiti, and they also matter behind bars in the United States and in the UK and throughout the world. We can't forget that. And the leadership now coming from Haiti, because the Haitians have never had anything. You know, they made a revolution, okay, and they kicked France out of the Americas, and they made the way for all of us, and it has an implication for people here. Right. The prisoners in California a couple of years ago followed Georgia and some other places, and they had a prisoner hunger strike that started 30,000 strong. And let me tell you about the leadership. There were folks in isolation in Pelican Bay, and they were black, they were Latino, they were Native American, and then one of them used to be a white supremacist. That's right, he used to be. Same thing happened in Georgia. They negotiated for two years 
some, uh, 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 a document calling for the end of racial hostilities because they knew that that was the way possible to make that hunger strike possible and effective. Now, that didn't mean they threw out black autonomy. Let me tell you, the black organizations were still there. The Native American organizations were still there. And I think some of those white folks were still hanging out with each other. But you know what? They came together and they made the way. It was 30,000 strong. It was the largest hunger strike in the history of the United States. And they were behind bars. What's the excuse for the rest of us? That is leadership. They are telling us what to do how to be autonomous, and how to build a united front. Because you know what? We cannot underestimate the enemy. We've made that mistake before, and we paid a big price for it. Too many of us have died. Too many of us are dying right now. And listening to what has happened at this conference, all of us got problems in here. We heard from Greece. We heard from the sex workers. We heard from Thailand. We heard from the uh, people with disabilities. We heard from the queer people. We all got problems. We know that. So what are we going to do about it? Are we going to find the way while we express the specifics of our own oppression and our own autonomy and do like the prisoners said and like the Black Panther Party elders charged us? to find a way to come together so that we can destroy this monster that is holding us all down. I likely only have a couple of, uh, two minutes or so, but let me, uh, just want to point out something to you, because we heard from Ireland yesterday. You know, I'm from Barbados. And Cromwell and whatnot, they did this thing of cleansing Ireland of the Irish. And they used to round up homeless, Irish people and ship them off as slaves to Barbados. And the only way it stopped is that the slavers got greedy. It was a little cheaper than bringing us from that. Now, it's not nowhere near the transatlantic slave trade that helped to build international capitalism. There's no doubt about that. And we want all the money that they stole from us. Yeah, yes, yeah. we do. And we want all the money they're stealing from women in our unwaged labor. We want that too. You could just add that into the reparations pot. Okay, but the way they stopped with the Irish after about seven years or so is the slavers got so greedy, they started snatching some poor English people. And in Parliament, they were like, oh no, we cannot take the British as slaves, right? But that's what the Irish went through. And Joy DeGruy, who talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome, she points out very clearly that race is a relatively new concept. It has been racialized and it's being used to keep us all down. So that when we say black lives matter, you know what? If black lives don't matter, no one's lives matter. Neither the lives of any of us matters. And the challenge that we have, and I'm not in a black lives matter organization, but you damn straight, I'm part of the black lives matter movement, is that we know that this isn't just a moment. This is a lifelong struggle, okay? It ain't a moment, and it ain't about a career, because I can see people being corrupted, them picking off who they want and who they don't want, and they sell us all down the damn river. Well, a whole lot of us are not going to be sold because we're going to find a way to defend our autonomy and at the same time, for the young people, find our way to Gaza and find our way to the Irish and find our way to the people with disability and find our way to the queer people because at the end of the day, we're not giving up nothing as black people, but as black people for us to survive, this planet has got to survive and we are all under threat. Thank you very much.